Richard, Kyle, Colin, Anna, Ollie, another Anna, Claire, Jenny. These were some of the people from whom I first heard the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Youth workers and school friends uh, when I was around the age of 13. Some Christians in my school. Um, a school's missioner who used to come in and help run Christian unions. I wonder if you remember who, from whom you first heard the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Think of that person now and let's just give thanks to God for them. Father, thank you for those people from whom we heard the good news of Jesus Christ be they our parents, be they youth workers, be they friends, be they uh, the person we're, to whom we're now married, whoever it might be. Lord, we give you thanks. We give you thanks that your gospel has been bearing fruit and growing throughout the whole world since the very first days right up to this day. And now, would you... Bless us with the presence of your spirit that our ears may be opened and attentive to hear your word to us this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Epaphras was the faithful minister of Christ on Paul's behalf who uh, went and shared the good news of Jesus Christ with a small gathering of people Roman citizens principally, also some uh, Jewish believers in Colossae. And thanks to that faithful service of Epaphras, I don't know, he was the equivalent of the person who said, let's run an alpha course next term. Who's up for it? Thanks to Epaphras, we have this letter from St. Paul written to this gathered community, the holy people in Colossae, the faithful brothers and sisters in Christ. That's how, God, uh, that's how Paul describes them in verse two. And he wrote them this letter. Uh, and in his introduction, he reveals to us again something of God's intention for our lives in response to the gospel. This is the second of two Vision Sunday sermons um, that are exploring these themes of God's faithfulness and our fruitfulness. Uh, you can catch up, as John said, on last week's sermon at the YouTube channel or on our podcast. And last week, we explored the idea of God's faithfulness. We looked at Philippians 1 verse 6, where Paul writes that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. In other words, we can trust God to finish what he has begun. We explored how God has invited us to become partners with him in the gospel, in this ministry of reconciliation, being the community who by our transformed, our healed, our reconciled lives show forth, bring forth God's heavenly glory. We reminded that God's purpose for us individually but also collectively as a local church is to become ambassadors of the ministry of reconciliation so that through us, through this gathering, this assembly here, every woman, child and man in the Hoxton neighbourhood may have an opportunity to know what it means to be reconciled to God in Jesus Christ. And indeed this is the purpose I believe of every local church throughout all ages and all places. In other words, nothing about you is an accident in God's eyes. You're his intention, his purpose, his plan. And he will faithfully carry on in you what he has begun. He is the faithful gardener who keeps on tending to the garden of our lives, watering, weeding, planting, feeding, so that we might become fruitful in the gospel. And last week we touched briefly on our vision, our mission, our values, to be a beacon of hope for Hoxton, to focus all of our activities under these headings of worshipping God, make disciples, sharing Jesus and transforming Hoxton, to remain rooted, relational, responsive, risk-taking in all that we do. And I briefly introduce to you these four areas, four focus areas that we believe, those of us who have been tasked with discerning how the Spirit is leading us as a church, PCC, staff team, other leaders, 
these focal areas that we believe God is calling us to concentrate efforts on over the coming years. And, and they are, firstly, to cultivate a thriving congregational life, to keep worship, gathered worship, at the very heart of everything we do. Uh, to pursue a relentless concern for kids and youth, a special sense of vocation we have here, to be always looking to pass on uh, the Christian faith, the gospel, to the next generation. To persist in our Love Hoxton project so that we can be good stewards of our resources. And the point of this is not just to be good stewards of our resources here and now, but also to pass on to future generations uh, a place of hospitality, a canopy, a tent, a building, which will be uh, able to gather future generations for worship, will be a base and a resource for mission in this neighborhood. I dream of, uh, I don't know, 100 years, 150 years from now, when all of us are dead and buried, there being Christians who meet in this place and say, thank God for those faithful Christians, those faithful brothers and sisters who in 2021 were sitting here and thinking, how can we make sure we hand on an inheritance, a legacy? We want to make sure we're providing for mission in future generations. And then finally, fourth, uh, the Beacon Project, a new focal area to think about how we respond with compassion to the needs of our neighbourhood. And uh, you'll have found on your seat, I'm very, very uh, I'm delighted that we managed to get these printed uh, just in time, a new published mission action plan. I'm not going to refer to this actually very much today as it happens, but I would love for you to take this away with you, have a look through it, uh, read it. It's a slightly abbreviated version of our mission action plan, and you can visit um, the website, stjohnshoxton.org.uk forward slash map, and you can read uh, the full text there, which talks a little bit about the listening and the process by which we discerned what God is saying to us, what we believe God is saying to us. But I hope that this will inspire you and help you remember just what it is that we believe God has called us to here in Hoxton. What I do want to do today is to think a bit more about the practical outworking of all of this in terms of considering what it means to be fruitful in this partnership in the gospel. So as a response to God's faithfulness to us, I want to think about our fruitfulness. St. Paul's letter to the church in Colossae celebrates the fruit of the gospel that is growing in them and throughout the world. It was there in our reading. The gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the whole world, verse 6. And then a little later in the passage, verse 10, that you might, that the prayer is that they might live a life worthy of the Lord, please them in every way, bearing fruit in every good work. This is part of God's purpose for us, as Paul perceives it. Paul give thanks, gives thanks that the Christians in Colossae have demonstrated faith and love, springing up from hope because of the message of the gospel. He gives thanks that they have responded uh, to the gospel message. And he's indicating that the message of the gospel, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting people's sins against them, that this gospel message has produced a result in the church. Something has changed about them. The gospel is good news. Not simply good advice. It's not just some good ideas by which you might want to lead your life. It's good news. It's something that has actually happened. Good news changes things. It tells us that something has actually happened. It's not vague or hazy, and it's not dependent on our response. It's an assertion, a proclamation that something has actually happened. Think about it this way. If the gospel was simply good advice, then it would be up to us as to whether or not we were going to take that advice and respond to it, whether to follow it or not. And in some sense, there would be no real power in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus if the gospel were merely good advice. If this were just like, this is a nice philosophy to live your life by, well, you could choose to follow it or you could choose not to. But there'd be no real power in the death and resurrection of Jesus because we would have the power to ignore or reject that advice. But if Jesus has actually died for our sins to remove the partition, the stain, the barrier that has alienated us from God, and if he has actually risen from the dead to show us that sin and death have no ultimate power over us, then this is good news whether we accept it or not. And of course, that's what 
Christians have believed throughout the ages that this is good news for all people, irrespective of whether people ever decide to accept it and respond to it. Christians believe that God has actually done something to change the course of human history. Now, of course, we do have some choice as to whether or not we're going to believe this or not. But the declaration that this has actually happened persists, whether we accept it or deny it. Good news is different from good advice. It's something that has happened that can produce in us a response. So look, let's just have a couple of analogies I was thinking about earlier this week that might help us explore this. If you have cancerous cells in your body, you don't want the surgeon to advise you about what you could do to tackle them. You want her to cut them out and remove them. And when they do a scan and they announce that the surgery is successful and there are no cancerous cells left, that's good news. It's not good advice, it's good news. You're truly liberated from that. The illness, the death sentence, the despair has been cancelled. If you're a cap centre client and you've been struggling with debt for years and years and it's resulted in depression and anxiety or an impoverished life, then the letter that declares you to be debt free is good news. You'll leap and you'll jump for joy because something has really changed. If you propose to your boyfriend or girlfriend and they say, yes, that's good news. Something has actually changed and there's new hope for the future. There's a change in status. Just this week, our dear friend Elias within our own church family received the letter giving him his right to remain as a refugee here in this country. That is a change of status. That's good news. Let's give a round of applause. You can turn and wave at him at the back. <laughs> I'm not going to embarrass him by bringing him up, but I did ask him if it was okay for me to share that good news today. But you see, the point is, that letter is now an, an, has a legal force and weight. Something has actually changed. It's not just good advice, it's good news. Life is now different. Good news changes things in a way that good advice doesn't. And St. Paul says that the gospel message having been received as good news by the Christians in Colossae, is like a seed planted in good soil, and it's now going to grow and bear fruit. And we'll look in a moment about the different kinds of fruit that the gospel grows, but it's clear from this opening passage in Colossians that something has actually begun to grow, and not just amongst the Christians in Colossae, but actually throughout the whole world. And indeed, the whole course of human history has been undeniably changed by the one event of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. There is no other event in human history comparable. There is no other event in human history, the news of which has spread across centuries and continents and produced a response of faith and trust in Jesus Christ. There's nothing you can compare. It's good news. It's like a seed planted in good soil that begins to grow and bear fruit and change things. Let's pause for a moment to consider the work of gardening, growth and uh, fruitfulness. I've revealed to you on many occasions in uh, conversations that I am a hopeless gardener uh, and the very few things that I attempt to grow tend not to. Uh, earlier this year, some of you will remember, we gave out these little, um, I thought, very funky little uh, seed paper coasters. And, um, and, and they're printed on the back and they say, plant a prayer for the mission of St. John's Hoxton. And they've got a verse of scripture. I was so proud of myself for this idea. These, these bits of paper impregnate, impregnated with seeds. And the theory, the theory was that you could take this piece of paper, put it in a little pot, cover it in some soil, put some water on it, and beautiful flowers would grow. Absolutely nothing in the vicarage. Nada. <laughs> um, did anyone have any success with these? Did anybody grow a flower? No. I don't know. I blame Brexit. Who knows? Um, I don't know what happened. They came from Holland. I don't know. I don't want to kind of... Who knows? Maybe there was something at the border, something at customs. I don't know. Something happened. I don't know. It didn't work. It was a great idea, though. I'm sorry, Nathan, that was an expensive failure in uh, our church's budget. <laughs> when things don't grow, I give up. But God doesn't. God is faithful. 
God keeps on going. God plants again. The conditions for growth and faithfulness are are simple. Good soil, seed, sunlight, water, and care. The soil of our hearts must be good to receive the word of the gospel. And I continually continually pray that God will break up uh, the hard ground of my stony heart and make my life good soil to receive his word. The seed is the message of the gospel that we've just been exploring. The good news of Jesus' death and resurrection that changes the course of human history and has power to change our lives. There is power in the name of Jesus to break every chain. The sunlight is continual exposure to the light of Christ in scripture. Your word is a lamp unto my feet, declares the psalmist. We must continually be exposed to the light of Christ in the Bible. The water is the gift of the Holy Spirit who refreshes us and nourishes us in prayer, in worship, in our holy communion. And the care and attention is given by God, our faithful God, who never gives up on us but continually tends to the weeds in our lives and carries on to completion what he has begun in us. You can see here that our role is principally cooperation, putting ourselves in the places where we can pray, read the Bible, worship, be encouraged by one another, remind ourselves of the message of the gospel. That's principally all we need to do and to be fruitful in our Christian lives. And that's why connect groups, that's why gathering for Sunday worship services or prayer triplets are so vital to us because those things keep us in the flower bed or vegetable patch rather than the brown garden waste bin. Paul prays for the Colossian Christians that they would grow and be fruitful. You see it and you read what he prays for in verses 10 to 12, that they would grow in knowledge, that they would be strengthened that they would have endurance and patience and that they would give joyful thanks. Now there's another word about growth and about fruitfulness that we just need to bear in mind, particularly when we're thinking about church growth. Not all growth is good growth. Anyone who has ever had concern over their expanding waistline knows this. It's true that healthy plants grow and bear fruit, but cancers also spread. So we need to find a basis for assessing whether the growth we experience is fruitful growth or not. The author Tim Keller has a book called Centre Church in which he explains a trap that some churches fall into, particularly when they're thinking about, as we are, thinking about things like mission, vision, what we're doing over the next few years. He says that they can use either successfulness or faithfulness as the paradigm, the category by which they, they figure out how they're doing the measure of, their, of, of how they're doing. And successfulness is a measure that focuses on growth and the appearance of growth. It tends to see church growth as a competition and is focused on techniques and tools for increasing the size or scope or influence of a church community. By contrast, faithfulness uh, as, a, as a measure tends to focus on doing the historic work of Christian churches, prayer, worship, local ministry and the like, but with little regard for the outcomes or the effectiveness of the mission. And Tim Keller suggests that we shouldn't let either success or faithfulness be the principal measure of our mission, but rather that we should remain focused on fruitfulness as we try to reflect on our stewardship of the mission work entrusted to us. And if we're seeking to evaluate our growth in terms of fruitfulness, then we need to have a rich and full understanding of what that fruitfulness looks like in terms of of growth. Paul Bays, who's the current Bishop of Liverpool, has a little mantra. He talks about a bigger church for a bigger impact. And, and that, in a way, is a measure of fruitfulness that's focused on, on numerical size and influence. Now, Rowan Williams, the former Archbishop of Canterbury, doesn't reject this, but he nuances it and talks about a threefold pattern of growth. Growth in holiness and spiritual maturity. Growth in the depth of our discipleship. Growth in the impact in our local neighbourhood, the transformational power of the kingdom of God at work in our environment. But yes, also numerical growth as people come to know Jesus and worship him. And in our church, we try to adopt this pattern in our Organising for Growth project, thinking about outreach, which is all about the missional and transformational growth as we participate uh, in this local neighbourhood, working with other organisations, people and institutions for the common good of Hoxton but also engagement, 
as we think about numerical growth, as we think about how to take the worship beyond our walls so that other people can join in and how we help people get through the barriers that are so often, I mean, today, just at the moment, all of the doors are open. I can see out to the road. But so often our doors are barriers to prevent people coming and worshipping Jesus. But finally, also depth, thinking about spiritual growth, how we articulate our Christian faith, how we grow in confidence in uh, our, our ability to explain the faith that it animates and inspires us. So we're trying to think about fruitfulness and growth in this church in terms of how are we, how are we doing in terms of compassionate engagement with our neighbourhood, transformational engagement with our neighbourhood, but also how are we thinking about growth in terms of people who gather in with us for worship on a Sunday, either in this building or online, but also in prayer triplets and connect groups and prayer meetings and other things that we do throughout the week. How can we make ourselves more accessible uh, so that more people can hear the good news of Jesus? And and thirdly, thinking about spiritual growth and depth. That's why connect groups are so important in the life of our church. And I'm so encouraged that uh, somewhere around 50 people have signed up, I think, so far this month for connect groups. And we want to see more people joining in with groups where they can read the Bible, pray for one another, deepen their faith. I said a moment ago that we need to think a bit about what kind of fruit is godly fruit, what kind of fruit uh, we should expect to see if we are remaining in that good soil, if uh, we are being watered by the Spirit, uh, exposed to the sunlight of Scripture and tended by God our Father. I want to run through a very quick list and I'm aware that my time is ticking on, Uh, so don't worry if you don't remember all of these, I might put these up on a blog post at some other point. But the New Testament uses the term fruit quite a lot and when I searched it and tried to work out how the New Testament writers talk about fruit, I saw a whole range of um, types of fruit that give evidence of healthy growth for the people of God, the New Covenant community. Firstly, the fruit of repentance. That's a strange fruit to begin with, but in Matthew 3, the message of St. John the Baptist, the forerunner, is that we should repent and believe. That is to trust in God's coming Messiah. Fruit in keeping with repentance is the way that John describes a converted life, a life converted to obedience to God. Change direction, change your mind, change your life is the way Eugene Peterson's message translation puts it. Fruitful growth in the church will be evidenced by changed lives, by lives which are characterized by repentance, turning back to God. So the fruit of repentance, Matthew 3. Fruit that is identifiably good, Matthew 7, second. Um, Jesus says that those who minister among God's people, the prophets or perhaps in our contemporary church, vicar, leader, priest, uh, can be identified as false or bad by the produce of their lives, just as a tree is identified by its fruit. If the, if the tree is growing apples, it's an apple tree. You know this. Um, so is the character of a leader in the church arrogant, puffed up, self-centered? Are they angry, envious, or unkind to others? These are bad fruits and to be avoided. If in the course of, the ch- of a church's growth, the ministry seems to serve the minister, then something has gone wrong. John says that trees that don't bear fruit in keeping with repentance will be cut down and tossed in the fire. So so the fruit of our leadership, you know, that the lives of our leadership need to to bear good fruit, healthy fruit. The fruit needs to be available. Um, Mark 11, Jesus uh, curses the fig tree for not bringing forth its fruit in due season. The fruit should be available to people for their nourishment. And when the fruit uh, isn't growing on the tree, the tree has become useless in this respect. So do our churches have fruit that is available to people in need? If those who are hungry and vulnerable are refused compassion or hospitality by the church, then perhaps any other growth that we observe is not entirely healthy growth. Number four, fruit offered to God. Luke 20, in the parable of the tenants, Jesus describes the servant as going to the tenants to collect fruit from the vineyard for the owner. There's a sense in which all the thing, everything that's been entrusted to us by God, we are the tenants in that parable, is supposed to be offered back to God in thanksgiving. Fruit that reproduces. John 15, famously Jesus says, if you abide in me, you will bear much fruit. Just as we can be seen as fruit of the gospel by our repentant and our converted lives, so too will others come to be a fruit through us. 
We saw that from Epaphras, didn't we? We saw it in that list of names that I gave you of people who shared the gospel with me. So are we reproducing growth? Are we, are we sharing uh, the gospel that has changed our lives with others? Is the fruit in us reproducing? Fruit of conversion. Romans 1.13, Paul speaks of seeking a harvest among the Gentile community in which the Roman church is situated. And just as other Gentiles have converted to Christ, so he hopes that more conversions will occur and describes that process as a harvest, the bringing in of that which has grown. Fruit of mercy to the poor, number seven, Romans 15, 28. And Paul speaks of the collection for the Jerusalem poor. Paul spent a lot of his time traveling around the New Testament churches, encouraging Christians to give generously a monetary gift that could be sent back to Jerusalem to support uh, the, the, the Christians there during a time of famine. And he describes the offering as a fruit. Generosity and charity are an appropriate kind of growth or fruit for the Christian community to display. One of the very simple fruits that will tell us whether we are growing good fruit and healthy and abiding in Jesus is whether we're becoming more generous with our money, individually and collectively. Do we we give generously to other organizations, other mission organizations, people beyond our walls, compassionately, whatever it might be. I know that last Christmas we had a collection here and people donated generously so that we could buy gift cards to be given out to people to use at Christmas if they were uh, struggling. So fruit of mercy to the poor. Fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5, perhaps the most famous of Paul's comments about fruitfulness. The fruits of the Spirit are born by those who keep in step with the Spirit. And they're contrasted in Galatians 5 with the licentiousness of those whose lives are not brought into obedient discipleship. In other words, there's a contrast. There's, there's pride, envy, greed, licentiousness, drunkenness, sexual immorality, all of these things which are the, the fruit of lives not under obedient discipleship. And then by contrast, there are those people who are bringing forth the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Then at the very end of the Bible, at number nine, fruit which brings healing to the nations. In Revelations 22, the tree of life bears its fruit every month and it grows leaves for the healing of of the nations. And then in the passages that we read last week and today, number 10, Philippians 1 and Colossians 1, a fruit of righteousness and a fruit of good work. In Philippians 1, last week, Paul spoke of the fruit of righteousness, right relationship with God, being reconciled to God in Christ, keeping a short account, coming to him regularly in repentance, in prayer, in confession, in worship, in thanksgiving. And here in Colossians, he speaks of bearing fruit in every good work. I'm going to cut a section because I've spent longer than I should have done. I want to uh, draw us into a conclusion. And uh, as I said, I'm not actually going to talk in in, in any real depth about this new mission action plan because you can all take this away and read it. But I'd encourage you to have a look at some of the, the mission objectives that we have set out under these themes of worshiping God, making disciples, sharing Jesus and transforming Hoxton. And to, and to have a look at the things we want to try and do to resource and support all of that mission work in leadership and administration in our building and premises. These are not hard and fast. We're not under judgment if we don't fulfill all of these things. But they're, they're the sort of fruit that we hope will grow on, among us in the coming years. And they give an indication of the kind of signs that we think will be markers of God's work among us. And they're a guide for how we cultivate the conditions that bring forth growth. Remember in uh, 1 Corinthians 3, Paul says it's not you who makes anything grow. All you can do is set about the conditions for growth. Apollos planted, I watered, but God gave the growth. All we can do is try and make sure that in our worship, in our prayer, in our discipleship, in our common life together, we're setting in place healthy conditions for growth. Good soil, broken up by repentance. Sunlight of scripture, the water of the spirit, the seed of the gospel, and making ourselves available to the care of the gardener. This growth is not just for our own church family here in Hoxton, and this is really where I want to bring us into conclusion. It's important for our own church family here in Hoxton, but another part of the fruit of 
God's work among us, our fruitfulness, is going to be our engagement in mission and ministry partnerships across uh, the wider city, the wider nation, and indeed throughout the world, because we're part of a wider work. It's what Paul said to the Colossians. The gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the world. So one measure of our fruitfulness is going to be how many people from amongst our number join in with that work? How many people respond to God's call to serve as workers in this harvest field? One measure of our growth and fruitfulness will be how many people we send to go and serve in other parts of the church. And with that in mind, I want to tell you some sad but exciting news. Uh, John Wyatt, who's over with the youth in the vicarage just at this moment, joined us as our worship pastor in 2018. And he has served us faithfully and fruitfully in our church family for over three years, leading the music ministry, the production team, and contributing significantly to the whole pattern of our Sunday worship services. And alongside this, he's grown into leadership in the youth ministry, as well as serving in a wide variety of other ministry roles across the life of the church. But we're sending him now to go and join in with a new mission project to help revitalize a church in the center of Blackpool in the northwest of England. So we're sad but delighted to be able to send him to go and be part of a new project. St. John's Blackpool is a church in the very center of Blackpool with a decent congregation but an opportunity to grow in number, to revitalize its mission and ministry and to help plant new congregations across the city of Blackpool. And John is going to be joining a new leadership team there as an associate minister with a variety of responsibilities encompassing work with students, youth, young adults, alpha, small groups and worship. And John and Rachel, his wife, are going to be leaving us uh, just before Christmas and enjoying a couple of weeks with family before starting their new life in Blackpool. We're really, really thankful for all that John has done in his role, uh, the sort of public leadership role, but also for all that Rachel has been able to contribute to the life of our church through connect group leadership, through prayer, through being part of the worship team. But they will be leaving in just a few months' time. And of course, they're not the only people who leave, who are sent from our number. Earlier this year, Caroline completed her curacy, her training post with us, and moved to Middlesbrough uh, to begin a new ministry there as vicar. We currently have Freya, Josh, uh, Stephen, Andrew, Louise, Zoe, all starting, all in the process of their training for ordination to serve as ordained clergy in the mission of the Church of England. We have others who have been ordained already. Alice, some of you remember Venning, who was with us many years ago. Julian, our former youth minister, who is now ordained and working as chaplain on the Peter Stream. His wife, Louise, in the process as well of training. And then we've had people like Sam who went out uh, to be a worship leader and James and we've had interns and Buxton associates like Claudia, Josh, John C, Sarah, Rachel, Sally, many people who have come and spent a season in our church and have been sent out to go and serve in some other part of uh, the vineyard. And then we've had those who have been called and trained and have stayed, Sarah and Morag, of course. And then, of course, all of you who are responding to God's call upon your lives to serve in this local church. And those training for ordained ministry uh, or or some form of authorised ministry with us, Bessede, Andrew, Louise, Will, David. So one measure of our fruitfulness over the coming years is going to be that question of how many people can be sent Uh, out into God's work in the wider church. The point of this is the fruitfulness of our church is not always measurable by the things that we can see on a Sunday morning among us, but it's often reported by testimony and the fruitfulness of of our local church may well be celebrated by others in other places. In the same way that I gave you a list of names of people who had shared the gospel of Jesus with me at the very beginning of this sermon. Who knows who in 10 or 20 or 30 years time will be talking about you and the influence you had on their life as you shared your faith with them. People can experience what it means to be reconciled to God in Christ. Their lives can be converted and transformed. 
they can experience the faithfulness of God, the freedom that comes with the power of the name of, name of Jesus to break every chain, chain, the friendship that we sang about earlier, friendship forever. They can experience that because of what we do, the positive impact that we have amongst our local neighbourhood. God wants us to be fruitful branches on the vine that is Christ. God is faithful to us and his purpose and intention is that we might be fruitful in him. Shall we pray together? Father, we give you thanks and praise for all that you have done in this local church over these past years, over these past decades, in the years since it was opened. We thank you for the countless lives that have been converted and transformed and sent out to be laborers in your harvest field, workers in your vineyard. We thank you that you count us and part of your plans and purposes and intentions for this local church. And just as you are faithful to us, we offer ourselves to you that we might be fruitful in the gospel, bearing fruit of good works, fruit of righteousness. Lord, as we prepare to send John and Rachel up north in this new mission venture, we pray that that might inspire us to say yes to your call in our own lives, to see where you are sending us, to see what work you are putting in front of us, to see how you are calling us. And we commit to you once again this new mission action plan, this new five-year plan. And we offer ourselves to you, asking that you would make us fruitful for your sake and for your kingdom. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen.